My father was born in Austria, came over here when he was six years old. Uh, he was a rabbi, his father was a rabbi, his grandfather was a rabbi. I'm glad you can celebrate with us. I'm not so tough at you. Uh, when is the baby coming in? And my father once said to me, this is the only profession in the world where you can really do things for people in a proper manner without ever asking to be thanked for it. Kindness and gratitude, peace, let us say, Amen. Amen. Now we're ready to get married. I think it's one of the greatest rewards that a rabbi has is to have that privilege of being so much a part of other human beings. Oh yeah, I always wanted to be a rabbi, except first I wanted to be a fireman and a policeman. After that I wanted to be a rabbi. Welcome to Congregation Beth Israel, or Temple Beth Israel. I welcome you here at the Shari Torah. I'm happy to welcome you to our congregation. When I used to give talks to uh, school kids about Judaism, I always started by saying Judaism is a religion of interpretation. Not whether I can pray better than the person next to me or they can pray better than me. My religion is how I conduct my life. I don't know of any community in the country who's had three rabbis the equivalent of 120 years. I don't know of anybody. 40 years for one rabbi to last in a congregation? I think it's unheard of. But three? More than 40 years ago, three young men arrived in Portland, Oregon to lead the city's three major synagogues. Through heartbreak and triumph, tradition and progress, they fulfilled their destinies as rabbis, and along the way, led an old world community into the 21st century. What is a rabbi? I think that a rabbi is somebody who, in some ways, is you know, the moral compass of a congregation and sets the tone for what that congregation will be. Judaism is a religion of guidance. Judaism says, we set up standards, set up law, and that this law is very flexible and applicable to every event that occurs in Jewish life. I, I didn't have a rabbi, and when I needed a rabbi very much, I called Rabbi Geller. They teach classes, they're involved in the conversion, the bat mitzvah and the bar mitzvah, and they're involved in the weddings. Can we, can we ask you a couple questions? So you should be on the right. So you should be on the right. Rabbi, would you just watch sure us go, re go through this one time? Oh, yeah. You should be after them. Other side. When she's done, yeah. should she, is there a certain side she's supposed to end up on, or does it not matter? Let's make it easy. I was determined as a youngster I would not follow the profession of my father. And so I decided to become a, a chemist, a research chemist. And uh, I pursued that profession for one year, and I became so lonely in the laboratory that I decided uh, to give in uh, and to study for the rabbinate. I don't think many people realize the, uh, the extent of this profession. First of all, you have to recognize that uh, to become a rabbi basically meant to become, you had to have an education. It wasn't, a, there was not such a thing as this, I got the calling, that didn't work. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed be this child whom we now welcome in the name of God. You see child born and then you see them enter religious school and then you see them go through their confirmation and their bar mitzvah and high school graduation and you marry them and then you name their children. I mean, it's really, it can be very satisfying, but to try and talk anybody into it, never would. The Jews that came into old South Portland came from uh, Poland and Russia and Lithuania, Hungary, Eastern Europe. How did Jews come to Portland? It seemed a bit remote. The German Jews, they were here first. 
most of the German Jews that lived in Portland, lived in the Knob Hill area, German Jews, in fact, never lived in South Portland. The immigrants that came to South Portland were the Sephardim, mostly from Turkey and Greece, in this case, and the Eastern European Jews. South Portland had few Jews before 1900, but by 1920, there were over 6,000 Jews in this neighborhood. They came for freedom, and they felt, when they came here, they felt that freedom that the country could give them. When they came to Old South Portland, they built their own way of having a livelihood by developing the things that they needed to live with. South Portland was very much a self-contained community. There was everything everybody needed. Could everybody please look both ways when you cross the street? This is one of the original apartment buildings in the neighborhood. I also want to point out the house directly across the street here. Mr. Greenstein's Hebrew school teacher lived here. This is the only building left in the neighborhood that still retains its original purpose. And it became the Mead Street Shul in 1912. When I came here 42 years ago, the congregation was composed of two elements. Half of the congregation were of the older people who were from a European background, who had come to America from Europe. And the other half were American born. Everybody was related to everybody else. They were all cousins, one brought over the other. So you couldn't say a bad word about anybody because you'd insult the entire community. We had uh, three major synagogues in those days. Three kosher butchers. Both Augusta Kirchner Reinhardt's and Milt Carl's families came from Russia. They remember what it took to build a new community in a new country. Everybody in the area gave a quarter. I know, because I used to go around with a slip to collect the quarters. And that was the money that they used to uh, give everybody that came in that needed a horse and a wagon. At that time, they were referred to as junk peddlers, but they were really, truly the original recyclers. The Jewish Community Center was the center of the, uh, of the community. The center was a meeting place for all the, you might say, the refugees, new people came into town, and uh, they had a lot of activity for young people. It was there for everybody. Okay, this is the neighborhood house. This was the heart of the community. This was founded in 1897 by the National Council of Jewish Women. I was three years old when I was in kindergarten at the neighborhood house. I remember sitting in a circle of little chairs. The kindergarten teacher playing with her hands, and we were following her with our hands, doing little stories. That's all I remember. Well, this is failing school, and this is where most of the immigrant children did go to school. And this is Miss Porter, Miss Fanny Porter, who was the principal a failing school. Most of the kids at failing school were Jewish. Oh, and that wonderful Miss Porter. She was the principal, and she loved every child in that school. Believe me, she did. But she wasn't easy on them if they were naughty. <laughs> I lived in Old South Portland. I lived in Southwest Fifth. We used to go to Old South Portland for our bread and our bagels and our delicatessens and so on. So I remember the characters there, especially the baker Mosler and his bakery, Callistro and Halpern. I was talking about the, the, the synagogue celebrating its 100th anniversary. I reminded people how it must have been important 100 years ago when those people came here, no streetcars. No freeways, no cars on the street, no paved streets. Everybody loved 
would just sit on the porch, and then you'd come up on the porch, and you'd visit a while, and then you'd go and visit another porch. We didn't have to invite each other. We just were a part of each other. Sort of the old world Jewish life transported to Portland. I graduated seminary in 1949, served my first four years in Lincoln, Nebraska. Now Lincoln, Nebraska at that time was already considered far out west as far as the East Coast was concerned. But I really wanted to come to the West Coast to explore the sort of the frontier of Jewish life in America. In 1953, Rabbi Joshua Stamfer arrived to take the reins of Ahave Shalom. That synagogue later merged with Neva Zedek to form today's Neva Shalom. Born in Jerusalem, Stamfer grew up mostly in the Midwest, becoming a rabbi like his father before him. He's a rabbi in the conservative branch of Judaism, which lies in between the more liberal reform Judaism and the more traditional Orthodox Judaism. The Yeshiva University, which I graduated from, called me one day and said, there's a synagogue in Portland, Oregon that needs real leadership, otherwise it's going to go under. Would you consider moving to, to the West Coast? I'd never been to the Pacific Northwest. In 1960, Orthodox Rabbi Yona Geller arrived from Texas to lead Shari Torah. That same year, Reform Rabbi Emanuel Rose made his way from New York City to Temple Beth Israel. All three congregations were in flux. It was a very difficult beginning actually because first of all we were newly married secondly the leadership at that time was in a just barely beginning a transition and frankly it was stodgy and I was a young rabbi came with new ideas and every time I mentioned I want to do something I would get a negative response and Portland at that time was kind of old-fashioned he was and 29 when he took this along I mean, this large congregation, very unusual. And there was only one new building downtown. It was the new wing, then new wing on the Benson Hotel. The other thing was, culturally, it was a shock because one day, Lorraine wanted to go out and get a cappuccino. First day in Portland. Yeah, and, and Portland didn't know what anything, anything was but regular coffee. Now we have coffee shops every other store. First of all, it was a very static community. I looked at the statistics in the American Jewish Yearbook. The population for Portland hadn't changed in 40 years. When I first came to Portland back in 1962, uh, the Jewish community was pretty insular and pretty much to themselves, as was the Christian community and what small little Muslim community there was. And there was hardly any dialogue. When I arrived, it was shortly after they had finally made a decision to build on the west side of the river. So I came to a new synagogue, but I came to a congregation with deep wounds. Most of the people who had opted for the east side of the river and had been disappointed resigned from the congregation. So there was a lot of rebuilding that had to be done. That was done. a great beginning. Everybody resigned. Oh, when you got yeah. <laughs> and when I came to Shari Torah, there were three rabbis in five years. And the word rabbi was such a bad word that I was here a month before I actually saw anybody outside of the actual presence of the congregation. <laughs> you know, all three of us, I think, had the same experience in the classical Jewish story about the desert island where two Jews landed and they built three synagogues, one for one and one for the other and the one for that neither of them would attend. But soon, the rabbis had a lot more than disgruntled congregations to deal with. At the dawn of the atomic age, Portland decided it was time to remodel the city. This is how Gussie Reinhardt remembers urban renewal. It was HUD that came in with urban renewal, and they literally tore down and burned up all the nice little houses. Those with means moved to other neighborhoods, like Irvington and Ladd's Edition. Others stayed behind. And they told the people at that time that they would help them get relocated, but they didn't. And the people struggled to find a place to live. 
The congregation existed on First Avenue for, from, I think, 1906. In 1954 or 55, the federal government declared urban renewal, and it was a, being taken away. And so they found a nice piece of property on Park Avenue. And so they bought the piece of property, and they built a beautiful new building. And on the very day of the dedication of the building, the building was dedicated on May 15, 1960, and I, that was the day they announced that I was elected to be the rabbi. The very next day in the paper, they announced a new freeway going to go right through the synagogue. It was an anti-Semitic freeway. It took away Shari Torah, it took away Never Sholem, and it took away the Jewish Community Center. All the three major institutions at that time in South Portland were eliminated by the freeway. Previous to my coming, and previous to Rabbi Rose's coming, the, the, fortunately there wasn't, there wasn't good relations between the rabbis, they didn't even speak to each other. And so when we finally got together, we made up our minds that we're going to change that perspective and that outlook. And so we did. And we formed the Oregon Board of Rabbis with the intention that we were going to work together for the benefit of the community, which in turn would be for the benefit of our own congregations. It serves uh, not only as a vehicle for bringing together uh, the spiritual leaders of the community in important projects, but um, we sort of need each other. They all have different political views, all have different religious views, and um, it was very interesting um, and kind of uh, nice to see that these rabbis had this mutual respect and also got along so well. I grew up in, in Toronto and the rabbis and the cantors, they, they argued amongst themselves and they argued against each other. Uh, there was a tremendous competition, um, you know, who's the better speaker and who's, who knows the most about the Torah and who, who whatever. Um, and here, you know, I think Portland in general, uh, people are very, they're, they're not as judgmental as they might be in a larger city. Zionism was a movement created for the purpose of enabling the Jewish people to have a home of their own. One of the early well, things that we did, that which problem. still remains a model in this country, I don't think and there's another community in America which has a course introduction to Judaism, which is taught by rabbis of all different points of view, uh, all different movements. I think that's one of the things that I've really liked about it is being exposed to different rabbis and different beliefs and different communities. I think that it's a great way to introduce people to it. Amy and David Elkanich are attending the Introduction to Judaism class. And the purpose was to spend 20 weeks with people who are potentially thinking about becoming Jewish. Well, and there you were when I first saw you. Aww. I was raised Jewish. Both my parents were raised Orthodox, and they raised me conservative. They were really good about Hebrew school. I went to summer camp at B'nai B'rith down here in Oregon. Uh, they were kept kosher. We kept Passover. I think it's a great picture of you and your sister. Yeah. I was raised Catholic. I was born Catholic and uh, confirmed and went sort of in and out of uh, how uh, regularly I practiced Catholicism throughout college. Yes. Where will the Palestinian state be? I mean, if we withdraw from those settlements in those areas, I mean, those originally belonged to other countries. So. I feel as though they talk a lot about what I already believe. And so I, I see real similarities in belief, despite growing up with a different background. Look. I think we're saying, that's right, we actually did it. We'll be married two years in August. It feels like we've been together forever. In a, in a good, good way. way. <laughs> <laughs> so after the dance was over and I danced with her, I walked her home and I started dating her and that was the end of the story for me. What I was most impressed with, I guess, was her Southern accent. Uh, she came from Atlanta, and I hadn't really heard much of a southern accent before, but she was very cute and very enthusiastic. One day, one of my very good friends called me up and said, I want you to come over and see something. 
So I walked over and he, at that point, showed me the rain. That's what he wanted, that's the it that he wanted me to see. He was cute, he was witty. He was young. We both enjoyed music. I heard him speak. He was very um, vocal and he made his comments and they were absolutely fantastic. <laughs> and I thought, what a wonderful man this is. I hope his wife appreciates him because he is just great. This is the kind of person I would like to marry. I thought he was very attractive and uh, he left me a note to say, would you like to have dinner? And I had no idea that he was a reform rabbi. I said, I don't want to be a rabbi's wife. He said, I don't expect nothing out of you, just be yourself, he told me. And to this day, he never asked me to do anything. But she does it anyway. I thought, we must be crazy getting married six months after we met. And I thought at that time, I don't think I would want my daughter to get married this quickly. When my parents heard that I was going to marry a rabbi, my uh, father flew over to meet him because he had visions of my uh, being in a little shtetl. My father went back to London and said to my mother, don't worry, just imagine that he's like a dentist or a doctor and she's going to be okay. I enjoyed every minute of it. Life never was dull, I always was in contact with people. Everybody's pleasure was our pleasure, everybody's sadness was our sadness. You felt part of a, you know, like family. Most women who marry rabbis know when they get married that they're marrying a rabbi. And all I knew when I got married was I was we're marrying a really wonderful man. Marriage, it's a given. Marriage is a given. Other friendships come and go, but marriage is a given. It's just there. It's part of your being. And after 45 and a half years, we're going to keep it that way. <laughs> to begin with, I want to ask you if you've ever had any anti-Semitic experiences. But as a first grader, I was, had been told by the classroom teacher that I should not say the Pledge of Allegiance because I was Jewish, not American. And this is way back. In where the, was that? Salem, Oregon. So the question is, where does all of this come from? Where does this stuff come from? One of the basic things that really started this all out was the accusation that the Jews killed Christ. I uh, decided to do my doctoral in that area on Vatican II on the document on the Jews, De Judaeus. 2,500 bishops of the church came together in Rome between 1962 and 1965 to update Catholic doctrine on all issues open the windows on the church, update the church, go through Catholic doctrine, bring it into modern times. That's what John XXIII did. And one of the things that he wanted to deal with was the relationship of the Roman Catholic Church to the Jewish people. The result, I had nuns bringing students from Catholic schools to visit the synagogue, which never happened before, priests coming. The first archbishop uh, to participate in a Jewish religious service in the country, which means in the world, was Archbishop Leveda, participated in one of our actual services. Now, you know, to some people that may mean nothing, but if you understand the whole history of the relations and the hostilities through centuries and centuries, millennia, actually, and you realize the changes that have taken place in society in this regard. It's really fabulous. I had a Catholic priest at my house for a Seder, you know. I've had a very good relationship with Christian ministers, you know. We both, I know what they represent. They know what I represent. We respect each other. It makes a different relationship. But as the three men, and in fact the entire country, would soon realize, there was much more than a theological revolution going on in the 1960s. 
The 60s were filled with all of the social problems. We had the Vietnam War, the assassination of John Kennedy, the civil rights movement. One of our specific reactions to Kennedy was that we had a uh, memorial service at the temple. And uh, the temple seats about a thousand people. And they were standing room and only outside for the Jewish community. It was incredible. So uh, that would indicate that we were part of that process. And it was a community thing. I mean, it was not only members of our Jewish congregations that came to it, but from the non-Jewish community as well. Besides navigating the 60s together, the rabbis were also busy working individually. Rabbi Geller helped found the Portland Jewish Academy. Rabbi Stamfer helped build numerous institutions, including the Oregon Jewish Museum. And across the river in Washington, Camp Solomon Schechter, Rabbi Rose became the first rabbinical lecturer at the University of Portland, a Catholic college. It's amazing how integrated uh, the Jewish and non-Jewish communities are here in the Northwest. Yeah, sure, there are differences. I repeat, I, I want to repeat it because I don't want to make believe that everything is apple pie, uh, but it's, it's really different. But Oregon was not always integrated. By mid-century, Jews in Oregon had already been active in politics. The state elected a Jewish governor, Julius Meyer, and later a United States Senator, Richard Neuberger. There were also many established Jewish businessmen, such as Meyer and Frank, and Ben Selling. But Jews in Portland still struggled for full inclusion in society. I remember very well, back in 1953, when, uh, Jews simply were not allowed in any of these uh, uh, civic clubs. Mac Club, University Club, uh, uh, Arrow Club. The Arlington Club, the golf clubs, didn't accept Jews as Mal members. Multnomah Athletic Club? Well, the Multnomah, Mac had a few members. They did. They had a few. Not many, but a few. Very few. <laughs> yeah, but they did. Days. But yeah. they did. The others had none. They weren't allowed. I think because of that history, of discrimination. Uh, they were sensitive uh, as a people to discrimination against others. And I think we can, you could well say that the Jewish community was pretty well united, whether it was orthodox, conservative, reform, or what have you, uh, in their support of civil and human rights for all people. How did we feel about it? I think to a great extent, we felt, well, if they don't want us, We'll have our own club. And so all of the interest Jewishly was in the Tualatin Club. It was a Jewish country club. That's all changed now. And interestingly, one of our distinguished members, Judge Gus Solomon, was instrumental. He used to be invited to the Arlington Club, where some of the leading business people used to gather. And there came a point when he decided he's not going to go to the club anymore, refused to go as a statement and things began to change. Things were changing in the home as well. The feminist movement is one of the most powerful movements that I can conceive of. One man made a quip about it. He said, it used to be that the man went to synagogue on Saturday morning, the woman stood at home. Now the woman goes to synagogue and the man plays golf. At the first, it was a little worrisome how the congregation would handle that, the fact that I was working. And I did not start working until my son was six, which meant that my oldest was about 15. And that's when I um, started to work in real estate. And that has absolutely opened a whole world to me. Never did, never did, never had to work, thank God. She worked, she worked at home with the family. That was enough work. At least he appreciates it, though. I'm a criminal defense attorney, which probably doesn't need too much explanation. <laughs> I don't think we do ourselves a service when we want to apply the same marriage standards today that we did 100 years ago when society isn't the same today. The change will come by. It has not been fast. It's slow. And there is, uh, there is rejection. I'm sure that Rabbi Yower is not particularly happy about it. 
have to be very honest with you. I'm not very happy with the situation. I think we had, a, I think we had once upon a time, a very fine situation. The situation was very simple. The prayer service was left to the men, and the women were the bosses of, and the Jewish family was basically a matriarchal family. The mother was the head of the house. And she took care of all the other matters. Her husband had two jobs. He went to the synagogue, and he made a living. <laughs> People come up to me, they'd say, well, I've never met a woman cantor before. And I got so I would just say, well, can't say that anymore. There were no female cantors before. Uh, now half our classes are made up of, uh, of females or more in the cantorial school and also in the rabbinic school. There's not really a role like cantor in other religions. They have music ministers which are in charge of the singing, and a lot of music ministers are organists, but cantors are always singers, and they are really in charge of the music of the service. It's considered of a clergy role rather than just a musician role. I'm living in an incredibly privileged time uh, where women who have come before me in the last 20 years have begun to pave the way with in the institutions, the seminaries, and now women are, of course, able to become rabbis within the conservative and reform movements, and are even working within the orthodox movements in, in different ways. We have to change. We have to have more participation by women in our synagogue, otherwise our synagogue is going to fail. We're not New York. We don't have the multitude of people. We're still a small community. And unless we recognize that the women have a place in our service, there's nothing that I've ever learned in the Torah that says a woman shall not participate. And this is Ben Gurion, first prime minister of Israel. I worked very hard trying to make Israel possible. And I'll never forget the time that the United Nations was deciding on whether to make the state. And uh, we, we stayed up all, almost all night watching the uh, vote at the United Nations. And when the vote came through for the establishment of the state in the United Nations, it was just like a bolt out of heaven. These were very exciting years after the Holocaust and the growing uh, uh, demands for a Jewish homeland, a place where Jewish refugees from Europe uh, could be welcomed rather than uh, unwelcomed as they were. The riots began, the war began. So uh, I joined the Haganah at the university at that point and participated in the War of Independence. Jewish communities all over America deeply attached to Israel. Israel is never far from the rabbis' minds, but they have not always spoken of it in <laughs> one voice. I myself early became uh, very involved uh, with the Interreligious Committee on Peace in the Middle East. Uh, which took a particular point of view, which was uh, uh, the idea being that uh, uh, the more that we can do in order to fulfill uh, the dreams and ambitions of the Palestinian people, the more likely we're going to bring about uh, peace between the two communities. When I first uh, subscribed to the idea of a Palestinian state, uh, very few in the Jewish community agreed with me. Today, uh, that's it's an pretty well accepted. That's an understatement. That's an understatement. Right. <laughs> but today, it's uh, it's a topic which is readily discussed, and you have even Ariel Sharon saying that it's going to happen and then because all... circumstances change. But we all had uh, points of view. As long as Arafat was there, we I think we seemed to recognize the fact that there was no possibility. Or that we finally realized that. He, <laughs> yeah, that's right. When he finally, we saw it immediately, he, he disappeared from the scene. The whole picture changes. Today, it's a different story. And also, there's been a big change in the Arab world as well. 
And so it's uh, possible now we will we'll eventually see a, a chance of real peace there. I saw a little article in the Oregonian that says, Rabbi supports Palestinian state. And I rubbed my <laughs> eyes and is, is that true? Because back then uh, it really wasn't stylish at all to, for a rabbi to stand up and say such words. It was blasphemy. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I got on the phone and, and read the article and I go, what, Rabbi Stanford? I listened to his lectures often and that's not the direction he was heading. So I got on the phone, called him up and said, Rabbi, my name is blah, blah, blah. I've been to many of your lectures and I am just really pleasantly surprised by your courageous position. So he says, well, uh, thanking me is not gonna be good enough. You really have to show up to the First United Methodist Church. We're having a meeting. Rabbi Stanford and I were at a restaurant and over a bowl of French onion soup lamenting that the fact that how in the world can we demonstrate that Jews, Muslims, and Christians can work and pray and serve together some way in this community without so much acrimony and hostility and hatred. So we came up with the idea and we proposed it uh, to Frank and the Oregon Interreligious Committee of a cavalcade for peace. And we would begin um, this cavalcade on New Year's morning uh, at Rabbi Stanford's synagogue. And I would speak at the synagogue and we would then have uh, prayer and some hymns and songs. And then we would say to the Jews and Muslims and Christians, we want you to carpool together down to a mosque. And, and the rabbi would speak from the mosque. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we would uh, end up at the first Christian church downtown and the Iman would speak at the first Christian church. But hundreds and hundreds of people showed up. And we had the, this wonderful cavalcade. And we decided at that time that eventually we would take a trip to the Middle East of Jews, Muslims, and Christians mm -hmm. traveling together to the West Bank, Gaza, and to Israel. And eventually we did. Oh, Although Frank said at the time, he said, well, I wasn't much of a Muslim until I went to Israel and uh, West Bank and Gaza, and I was impressed by Reverend Page's spirituality, and then I decided I had to become a Muslim. <laughs> a devout Muslim. <laughs> and when I get to heaven, I'm going to have to say to the Lord, well, I've only converted one person, but it was to the Muslim faith. <laughs> when I saw those two gentlemen, friends and, and colleagues and mentors, and I saw their peace with themselves, I started researching more and more into my religion. And that's when I said, you know, hey, I have a beautiful religion as well. But I always say it took a reverend and a rabbi to get me back to Islam. <laughs> Joining me uh, this evening are two good friends with whom I have shared uh, some interesting activities. First of all is Father Maslowski, who looks like a Catholic priest, talks like a Catholic priest, and is a Catholic priest. You know what this is They have people singing up in the balcony there. Next to him is Imam Shabazz, dressed like a Muslim, <laughs> looks like a Muslim, and is a very distinguished Muslim leader uh, in our community. <clears throat> but the Portland Chamber Orchestra is going to perform the magnificent uh, oratorio by Mendelssohn on Elijah. We thought as a prelude to uh, that performance that we all have a chance to get to know a little bit more about Elijah the prophet. The figure of Elijah, the personality, the story, the history, connects between all the religions. Why not to take it one step further and really bring the community together and all different people from all different other religious directions and, and to really unite the community beyond the, the idea of Elijah. Catholics I think strangely to some, but not strangely to us, always feel very much at home 
when we come to temple or synagogue because we acknowledge, first of all, that our Jewish sisters and brothers are truly our ancestors in faith. From them, we have received the law, and the covenant, the prophets. From them has come uh, our Jesus and his disciples. From them has come the one great truth of God, the oneness of God, that there is but the one God. Do we recognize any other time when we recognize each other as we do today? Do we recognize any other time when we have dialogues and discussions and open hearts reaching out, trying to find the likeness in each other as we do today? But today, more than ever in any time in my short life, I see an earnest attempt across the globe for us to recognize the word of God in all of his prophets and to see that thread, that tie that binds us together. I see Elijah, he is not separate from me. I don't see Elijah as a Jewish possession or as a Christian possession or as a Muslim possession. No, I don't. I see Elijah as I see myself, as a possession of God. Perhaps the spirit of Elijah is moving today across this earth. Most of the success is due to her. You should know this. I mean, uh, no man, uh, only, a, only a successful man is only successful because of his wife. Don't say if that. If I had a different wife, You're I'd never been successful. Man. You're she just always floored me just from the second that I met her. And um, I mean, the, the first time I, we went out, I knew that we were going to be together. That's um, true. We did. Do you think you want another cookie? <gasps> I found myself in a position where I met David. And there aren't very many Jews out here. You know, you can't really control who you fall in love with sometimes. Marriage in itself is tough enough. But if you have a divided religion in the marriage, you have, you have another factor that creates tension. What kind of tea do you want? Amy and I, even though we grew up in different faiths, I think that we share many of the same beliefs. And I think that we've always felt that way. I think they blended. Well, we disagree. <clears throat> I don't think it blended. I mean, I think that it was maybe easier for David than it was for me. Um, Probably. Okay, hey, Paul. Good girl. I've told my parents that we're in the class, okay. and that, and my parents know that we'll raise our children Jewish. But they sort of know. They know. They know. I mean, my parents and I don't. I mean, they're comfortable knowing what they know. I think, and um, so. Yeah. I think it will be something that will need a lot more definition as we go along. I mean, there have always been wonderful and very respectful of the fact that I'm Jewish. I mean, when we go to, for back for Christmas, they wrap my Christmas presents in Hanukkah paper. Um, and when they stick them under the tree, and my stocking has a little Star of David on it. And so, I mean, they've always been very respectful. Right now, when you're both very much in love and you're young and you're happy, it's fine. But someday, you're going to have children. And then you're going to have to make very important decisions. Is he going to be raised Jewish or is he going to be raised Christian? Uh, you can't do both. You can kid yourself. You really can't do both. Either one, it has to be one or the other because they're, they're not comparable in that sense. I think we both still remember exactly where we were when we realized that that was going to be a problem. We were at Shea Jose's in, on Broadway, and I don't remember exactly how the conversation got started. Shea Jose, uh, I thought we were at Lewis Cl Clark. No, Lewis. that was a separate, different time. So obviously it's come up with us a lot. I like that picture of my dad and I too. We had agreed that we'd kind of raise our children in, with both faiths. I don't really know how you do that, but people seem to uh, manage to do that. So we had come to that agreement and I kind of broke down and said, you know, I just can't. Not only can't I, but I don't want to. 
and we're going to have to come up with some other solution. We then try to convince them, look, it's much healthier for both of you to either make, make your family one religion so you'll be able to solve this problem even before it occurs. Um, I've often wondered what it's going to be like as someone who, if I choose to ultimately convert or become Jewish, um, whether or not as someone who wasn't born it, I would be viewed differently or accepted differently or whether our child um, would be looked at differently because we're both not Jewish or things like that. But, um, but I, I think I look Jewish, so they, we can hide it from everybody. Are you better off to cut them off and then you're cutting off everything or are you better off to accept and be happy? You know, in the old days, I have to tell you, when I was growing up, you never heard of a Jewish person getting a divorce. It was very, very rare, you know? And today, you know, it's like every other religion. You know, if you don't get along, boom, boom, you have a divorce. Now, there's nothing to be said against it as far as that goes. So there's no guarantee if a Jew marries a Jew that they're going to get along any better than a Jew marrying a non-Jew. We have an opportunity now to be involved with families uh, that knew nothing about Judaism before. We use the phrase, replenish the ranks of our people. Because as you know, in World War II, 40% of the world's Jewish population was murdered. My mother's actually a first generation immigrant. She escaped from Hungary during the Hungarian Revolution in 1956. Both of her parents were in the Holocaust and all their family. I think that that's part of it, is just that feeling where it shouldn't have been in vain that somehow you're kind of letting them down if you don't keep it going. And I don't know how important that really may be to keeping Judaism alive, is that feeling of kind of obligation and duty and a nice smattering of guilt. It has a kosher symbol, O-U Parv. It's the letter O and the letter U for Orthodox Union, and Parv means basically neutral. It can be used with a meat meal or with a dairy meal, because under Torah law, Jews have to separate meat from dairy during their eating. Hi, how are you today? You want to warm that up? Today, instead of having to go to a special kosher butcher or baker, you can often find kosher food at the local supermarket. We have a, our own kosher bakery in store where everything that's baked here in our oven is parv. I turn the switch on and off every day to make sure that it's Pas Yisrael, baked by a Jew. Oh, it's a lot easier now to be an observant Jew. <laughs> the number of congregations that exist, the number of rabbis uh, that exist, that make it easier for a person to express their personal views of Judaism. There are many different communities within the Jewish community, and people are encouraged much more to think for themselves. And that represents, you know, it's going to represent all kinds of challenges to the way we organize and determine what the priorities of, quote, the community are. So I think, especially in the Northwest, um, Seattle, Portland, we really are kind of the face of Ju new face of Judaism in some ways because there's one partner who just can't leave it behind and one partner is kind of um, brought in from you know their spouse their significant other others are very much going to be walking in the door and they're going to need to be honored uh, so some of the old distinctions and boundaries don't exist for us the way they once existed there's sort of been a freeing up that is reflected in the Jewish community also of people who want to do things in a certain way. They don't want necessarily to be guided by the existing institutions and therefore they create their own. I welcome it. I think it's a wonderful addition to the community in terms of the breadth and expanse of Jewish life. 
Now you have such a range from Chabad Hasidim to humanistic Jews to New Age Jews. That's what synagogue life is becoming more and more. And people are bringing in questions that relate to other traditions of opening up the space where people can hear one another. Traditions of meditation, traditions of chanting and listening power. That was unheard of 50 years ago. There's a richness in, in the community uh, that didn't exist before and uh, it makes it much more fascinating to live in. I, I think that that's the good side of it. I think there's also a downside and that is I think we've bitten off more than we can chew as a community. Take a normal community of our size somewhere in the east. They might have five or six congregations. We have 18 in Portland. That's too many. In time, this will all be figured out, and we'll find more efficient ways to provide for the positive aspects of the diversity that Rabbi Stanford addressed. Well, I don't want to turn this into a debate, but it it's a good does, example it, of how we does, can discuss exactly, things. Exactly. It's, it's a reflection of different uh, points of view. Even if you're wrong. Uh, <laughs>Well, we're pregnant. Uh, it's, it's very exciting. Everybody remembers their lines? It sort of changes at least the way I've been thinking about community because I think it's really important, and mm -hmm. Amy and I have spoken about this before, that our child be part of a community. I can't imagine not having our child be Jewish, and I think at this point neither can David. On behalf of Rabbi Geller, who was originally going to conduct this ceremony, but unfortunately had a fall wants to express his deep fondness for you and best wishes on this occasion. And I was very happy to be able to share this because uh, a couple of years ago I married your parents. <laughs> and, uh, You're sort of picking up the baton as... That's you know, right, sort of. <laughs> one, one, one but it's not a relay race, yeah. though. <laughs> we have been able to reach out, to communicate, to be in touch with the community uh, in a remarkable way that uh, we wouldn't have been able to do if we had remained isolated from each other. If you isolate yourself into a corner, that's where you remain. But if you want to have an, a, an impact on the community, the only way you could do it is to work in cooperation. And, and to recognize the fact that you don't compromise your principles, you don't compromise your, your ideals. I think they took a chance. They took a lot of hits. They took a lot of criticism. They withstood them. And the ultimate thing that we see right now is success because Oregon, I truly believe, is different, by no means unique, but definitely different than many, many other states and areas of the world where we really see this inclusiveness, this collectivity, this understanding, accepting of the other. And uh, I think that's a tribute to, to the gentleman we were talking about uh, to a large degree. And every generation takes us a step forward. And that's what this day is really all about. I'm gonna be sort of jealous of my success or wherever that's gonna be because I think we're all turning over a wonderful thing but the challenges are somewhat different. I think they're more difficult in a way today. If 50 years ago we were still dealing with anti-Semitism, certainly institutional anti-Semitism, what we're grappling with now is an open society. Uh, the blessings of an op open society have put all cultures at great peril to define themselves and what distinguishes us from, from others. Life evolves. I mean, the life is not static, it's dynamic. I don't know what's going to be 10 years down the line for today, what's going to be a new issue, but I'm sure as people live in a society develops, new things come forward, and new approaches to everything. That's why it's a difficult for a person of my age sometimes to accept these new theories, but I have to step back and say, look, this is the new generation. Our generation did things that the previous generation didn't like, now they're going to do things that we don't like. That's how it is. The ethics of the Father says it's not up to you to complete the work. 
There are many areas in which we can develop more, provide more, lead more, and that's why we need another generation of rabbis to do just that. May God's presence always be with you and give you peace. To learn more about the three rabbis, visit our website at opb.org slash the three rabbis.